The first official day of the United States of America was April 30, 1789. That is when the first president under the Constitution was inaugurated, George Washington. It was an incredible moment in history. Here was the United States of America at the very start of a newly constituted nation. This was the beginning of the American experiment of self-rule under God. So how did George Washington handle the day? We often hear that the founding fathers were very secular minded and they certainly didn't want to see religion in the public square, or so we're told. But as Dr. Peter Lilback, founding president of Providence Forum, for which I serve as the executive director, points out, Washington did acknowledge God in many ways on the first day in the history of America as a new nation. One of the remarkable evidences of Washington's Christian commitment is seen in, in his first inaugural experience. He is now coming to lead the nation. It has never been done before under the Constitution. After all the struggle to have a unique government for America, he now has been elected unanimously, in fact, and that will happen twice. It will never happen again. Washington is utterly unique in this regard. And how do you start? Well, he's going to take the oath of office. We know the Constitution does not require any religious expression for a man taking the oath of office. But he's going to take an oath. And following his strongly held tradition from the Anglican and Virginian context from which he came, he wants to take that oath with a Bible. A Bible is not present, and they run and get one from the local Masonic home. We know which page it was on because the corner was turned down. That same Bible, I believe, was used when George W. Bush was inaugurated as president. That is actually the chapter where Jacob or Israel is blessing his sons. And so now the father of the country, if you will, is blessing his sons. His hand is on Genesis 49. And as he takes the oath of office, he adds words that are not in the Constitution, but were spoken by him numerous times, even when he began his public life as a surveyor. In Virginia, when you took an oath, you always concluded it with the words, so help me God. And so Washington starts a tradition that has been carried on since that time, not in the Constitution, but when the oath of office is taken, it is said, so help me God. And it's fascinating that those that witness him taking his inaugural uh, oath he, they saw that he followed another Anglican custom, and that is he bent over and he kissed the Bible. When an Anglican, an, or let's say an early Episcopalian, took an oath, the reason he kissed the Bible was saying, I've made a promise with my lips, and I know I can only keep this promise if they are committed to the Word of God. And he believed that he would have to give an account for those words. In his farewell address, he'll actually say, this religious principle that's so important for our constitutional happiness is necessary because that's how we maintain the oaths. We remind people, you're going to have to answer to God for what you're saying under oath. Not just the government. God himself is going to hold you accountable for what you say. Washington understood the significance of his oath, and so he kissed the scriptures. But then when he was done, he gave his inaugural address. It's fascinating. One observer said, a man who never shook before enemy bullets was shaking with his paper in his hands, but he was terrified at the great task before him to lead a government. And so he gave his uh, address, and that's where he refers to God's providential involvement in America and how America never could hope to be a successful nation if it did not follow the eternal rules of order and right that heaven itself had ordained referring to the Ten Commandments, the law of God, which he had regularly seen when he would worship in his church, looking at the Reredas in his uh, sanctuary where there was the uh, Lord's Prayer, the Apostles' Creed, and the Ten Commandments. He knew that was the basis of law. God's law was the hope that others would keep the law. And then finally, when this was done, he walked a few blocks with several others to a little uh, now Episcopal chapel and that's where they had a two-hour worship service, thanking God for the beginning of a new form of government, a newly elected president. And then we have the record of a lady named Mrs. Alexander Hamilton, who recorded with her family how on that particular day she had the joy of kneeling and taking communion with the newly elected president of the United States. This destroys any claim that Washington refused to take communion because he was not a Christian. 
here in the most auspicious day of his entire life, he goes from the public celebration to a worship service and he communes, not in an Anglican church, which he couldn't commune in because of his conviction that the king of the Anglican church was no longer the head of the church or the head of the state. He was a tyrant. Now in an Episcopal church, no longer the English church, he was reunited to his church tradition, reunited to his public witness to the gospel, taking the Lord's Supper. In the Revolutionary War, the evidence, he could not participate in an Anglican church, so he went and communed in Presbyterian churches. And uh, it's fascinating, he still had a record of wanting to commune from time to time. But now, back in his church tradition, he did commune at the Lord's table, and Mrs. Alexandra Hamilton said it was her great joy to have witnessed that and participate in that worship service. So all of these things then, uh, from his uh, So Help Me God, kissing the Bible, using the scriptures, appealing to providence, calling to the Ten Commandments, leaving there to walk to church, going to two-hour worship service, and then taking communion show that Washington was in the Christian tradition, and openly so, and saw the beginning of his new work as president as one where his Christian faith did not have to be shelved behind, but rather everything he did as a private citizen and president could be consistent with his convictions without imposing his values on anybody else. And so Washington beautifully established the principle of private conviction for a person in public office without imposing his views on others, freedom to follow their own tradition. And that's, of course, the First Amendment, even before it's written. Freedom to exercise without Congress establishing any form of religion. But it was in the Judeo-Christian tradition that Washington exercised his role as the first newly inaugurated president of the United States. George Washington was a Christian statesman. He set a high and godly standard for those to follow in his train. Clearly, he did not banish religion out of the public square or simply treat it as, quote, end quote, ceremonial deism. In other words, going through the motions while acting as if it really doesn't mean anything. Those who question the man's Christian commitment, in effect, are saying that George Washington was a great actor, worthy of an Oscar. Is it possible that the United States has been blessed as a nation because when it began, it was dedicated to the Lord in a very powerful way. As the psalmist says, blessed is the nation whose God is the Lord. For Providence Forum, I'm Dr. Jerry Newcomb.